recording has started, Bernard. Okay. So this is the March 15th, 2022 meeting of the W3C WebRTC Working Group. Uh, the group abides by the W3C patent policy and only companies and people that are listed on this status webpage are allowed to make substantive contributions. So today we're going to cover WebRTC SVC, WebRTC extensions. A lot's going to talk about avoiding the Hall of Mirrors. We'll talk a little bit about Get Viewport Media and then uh, Media Capture Extensions PRs. So uh, for the future, we are going to meet also on April 19th and May 17th at the same uh, time. And that is up on the W3C uh, WebRTC Working Group Wiki. OK, a little bit about the meeting. The slides have been published to the wiki. We do need a scribe to figure out when we make decisions and write that down. Do we have someone volunteering? I'll take care of it. OK, thank you, Dom. Uh, as you heard, the meeting's being recorded, and the recording will be made public. A little bit about the code of conduct. We do operate under the W3C Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. We're all passionate about improving what we see, but let's try to keep it cordial and professional. A little bit about the meeting tips. Please type plus Q and minus Q in the Google Meet chat to get into and out of the speaker queue. And if you can, use headphones or an echo canceling speaker phone. Uh, wait for the microphone access to be granted before speaking and state your full name so we can get you in the minutes. We probably will use the poll mechanism uh, today, so to figure out the sense of the room or just get input from people. A little bit about document status. Just because something's hosted in WC repo doesn't imply adoption by the working group. That requires a call for adoption, as you've seen on the mailing list. Editor's drafts do not represent working group consensus, but the working group drafts do once they're confirmed by the call for consensus. Uh, it's possible to merge PRs that lack consensus if a note's attached that indicates that. OK. So now uh, for our first poll, and I guess we'll need a little help from Harold. Uh, and the question is, are you considering attending in person the TPAC 2022? And the uh, possible answers are yes, no, and you have no idea. Uh, but let, me, let me introduce quickly sure. why the question is here. So you know that the past two TPACs due to the pandemic have been purely virtual uh, with some of the pandemic impact diminishing in some region. Uh, there is discussion about having a hybrid TPAC this year uh, in Vancouver week of September 12. The idea would be that there would be a greater emphasis in uh, enabling remote participation, but still with potential uh, people being together in Vancouver, uh, meetings, having meetings there. Um, the question is whether there would be enough people to justify uh, all the work and expenses needed to get such a meeting uh, set up and running in September. And so I guess we've been asked by the event organizers whether or not we think uh, people would show up and to what extent. So this is just trying to gauge uh, how many of us feel today that they would likely come, likely not come, or they are simply too much in the dark to express a, a useful opinion. OK, I can start a poll. So uh, you, you now have to touch the uh, triangle stuff down in the right-hand corner of your screen ah. to, to, get to, uh, right. to, get, to get to the poll and answer it. Is it anonymous or just out of curiosity? It's anonymous. Or I have no idea whether it's recorded somewhere who goes for what, but it uh, seem, seems anonymous. Nine. I can't see who, who voted for what. OK, 11, 11 votes so far. We are a total of 14 people, so. Or it might be 13 if I'm counted twice. Two. 
Just I'll one see. more. <laughs> <laughs> we have two Harald and two Bernard, so that's actually only 12, I guess. So. Oh, the, I have two of me? OK. Yeah. That's weird. So, okay, uh, I guess that's probably as much information as we'll get. So three yes, four no, four don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So there you have it. It's definitive, whatever that means. Yes, def def definitely don't know. Or def definitely even. Okay. All right. So for discussion today, uh, the agenda as much as I talked about, um, and this is roughly the time allocation. So we we should, should try to keep to the time. I guess I'll be talking, so maybe Harold, you'll have to rein me in if I go over. Hmm. Okay, so uh, here are the PRs and issues we're gonna talk about, one in WebRTC SVC and two in WebRTC extensions. Um, so in WebRTC SVC, issue 68 relates to the behavior of get parameters. And specifically the text uh, that was there was unclear about renegotiation. So it talks about before negotiation has completed and then after. And the question is, OK, what does this mean about renegotiation? Renegotiation like you did an initial negotiation. Now you're renegotiating. Well, what's it, what is the situation that applies then? <coughs> um, and if you read the original text, um, you know, it seems to say it, it's kind of unclear what it, what happens during a renegotiation um, and what, uh, you know, what values you get back. So what I would like to propose here, um, I mean, to the extent you can look at this and give any reaction, is the following text where it's clarified that we're really talking about initial negotiation um, and, and after the initial negotiation. So Basically, what I think happens is after initial negotiation, get parameters will always return to currently configured scalability mode uh, for each encoding. <clears throat> um, and that, that includes, so if you do an initial negotiation and are renegotiating, you're still going to get the currently configured scalability mode. Um, and uh, so this is this is the clarification that I'd, I'd like to put into the spec. So basically, before the initial negotiation has completed, you get the scalability mode uh, that was last set by end transceiver and set parameters. It may not be the one that uh, you'll see after negotiation is completed because you know the codec might not support the mode that you put in. Um, and if you don't provide anything, then uh, or if it wasn't successfully set, then you don't get you don't get a value for that encoding. Uh, but after initial negotiation, you get the currently configured one. So does this make sense to people, or do you have comments or concerns? This certainly works for me. OK, so you think, you think I, may, may, yeah, go ahead, Yaniva. I don't know if we're doing Q, but I, I, I'm i not sure this is correct, because I, ah, okay. I believe uh, get parameters. Uh, the, I think the algorithms are already very explicit about what you get. And it says encodings is set to the value of send encodings, which I believe is uh, set uh, in local description. So we had this issue uh, hmm. that um, some of the information comes from the pending, can come from the pending description, and some of it comes from the current. And I think the codex, I was trying to look at the issue, so I, I wouldn't speak incorrectly but right now I, I think they're different i'm trying to find the issue where i filed that well yes i mean, I think what you're talking about yanni varis let's say you called set codec preferences to change the preference order like that's a a pretty uh interesting one right and now you're renegotiation renegotiating like here's a weird example you were using vp8 and you got uh you were using, for example, L1T2. Now you renegotiate to H264, which doesn't support any scalability happens. Um, so that's kind of a very concrete example where you, after you finish the VP8, your get parameters is returning L1T2. Um, now you call set codec preferences. At what point do things change? Um, and um, 
Well, <clears throat> yes, um, I, even without get, uh, calling set codec preferences, I think there's a, a question of uh, that uh, get parameters may return different information depending on whether a negotiation, a renegotiation is currently happening or not, because uh, the remote offer could, can well, wait, if, if you have a local offer that might affect the, if you just changed something in the local offer that might affect the result. Right. So Harold, um, can we just talk about that specific case that I mentioned, switching BPA for H264? Um, so uh, what do you think happens during the renegotiation? Before I, I get confirmation of the change to H264, I'm still going to get L122 back, right? And my my reading would be that as long as you're sending with the VP8, you right. you should get L one T two back, right. And at the moment you switch to H two six four, you get L one T one back, right. Yeah, that's what I would expect, and I wouldn't. Yes, I mean that's what I think this text is trying to say, which is just uh, you know while you're in progress, nothing's changing. Right. Just because yeah. I called set code at preferences, I sent an offer. Nothing's changing. I'm still getting the. I'm still acting as though it was VP8 and L1T2. As soon as, uh, so I, I think if we're, if what we're saying is correct, then the, then the text does make sense, right? Have a, after the initiation, it's always the currently configured one. And so, like you said, when it when you're actually sending H264, it switches to L1T1. Uh, anyway, I think uh, Yanivar, if you could write up your concern in uh, on uh, in issue uh, sixty eight, we can kind of go through it in more detail to see if there's a problem here. Okay, uh, uh, issue sixty eight on in uh, Weber CSVC. SVC. Okay. Yeah, okay. just uh, try to trying to figure out if there's just we'll try to go into more detail and see if there's a problem. Okay. Um, so I think that's the resolution is, uh, Yana, we'll continue the discussion in, in the issue. Uh, okay. So now we're on issue 98. This is, we've now switched over to WebRTC extensions. Um, and this issue is relating to disabling hardware acceleration. So, uh, FIPO provided a long list of hardware acceleration implementation bugs that we've experienced. Uh, and it's really quite, quite an incredible little list. And I won't bore you with all of the details, but basically, um, hardware acceleration changes are very hard to test. Um, they often uh, create problems. And so the question is whether we, we can provide a way to disable hardware acceleration. Uh, an example of this is in Web Codex today. For example, you, in the video uh, encoder config dictionary, there's a hardware acceleration member, and it can take a value of no preference, uh, prefer hardware, prefer software. Um, at least as it's been implemented, this is actually not really a hint. The spec says it's a hint, but it's not really. So if you say prefer hardware, you're going to get hardware or or uh, or bust. Prefer software again, uh, software or bust. So here are some. We've been thinking a little bit about this, and uh, two approaches came to mind. One is uh, using set parameters to set. Uh, some kind of a hardware preference, and the other is set code of preferences. When I was thinking about set parameters, it seemed like this wasn't necessarily a great idea because it would have the limitation that you, as we said in WebRTC CPC, you can't change the envelope negotiated by offer answer within set parameters. And the problem is if you had a hardware only codec, like a, a higher profile of AV1 or something, um, that could only be done in hardware, and you try to disable hardware acceleration, you, you'd have to throw there. Um, or same for software, if it was software only, you couldn't say, I prefer hardware if you only have a software codec. And then the question is, is it really necessary to be able to switch midstream? Does this even make any sense? Like in the middle of a call, you'll just say disable hardware acceleration. Um, so I have some concerns about whether we, whether set parameters makes any sense for this. The other way to go about it would be to try to do it in set coded preferences. So it would basically change your negotiation preference. 
you then uh, potentially would disable some profiles, like if you said uh, prefer software, and there were a few profiles that were only in hardware, those would disappear from create offer uh, from the STP, then you'd renegotiate. And so um, whatever you got would be something you could actually support and some of these complexities wouldn't happen. So one specific idea is to add a hardware acceleration member to the RTC RTP codec capability dictionary. Uh, and that, as I said, would influence the codec and profile combinations that would show up in create author and create answer. Um, and if if you set to something to prefer software, you wouldn't get any uh, profiles that depended only on hardware. And then um, the other related question is what would happen in RTC, RTP codec capability? How would you discover this? Um, uh, and Media Capabilities API, I guess there's issue 185, which is allowing you to retrieve the codec capability from Media Capabilities. Uh, I guess Johannes can comment on, on how that's going. Um, and then the question would be, if, if we did that, would you have a hardware acceleration member be returned, or um, would you just do what we do today, which is return smooth and power efficient and supported? Um, and that would be enough info. So any any thoughts? So I have uh, Jan Nivar on the queue, and Dom, Dom has raised his hand. OK. I think Dom beat me. Uh, so I, I'll go first. And um, I guess the first question is, do we really expect developers to be um, keeping track of these hardware implementation bugs and so to be doing the job of saying, yes or no, I want hardware acceleration? Wouldn't it be more efficient if browsers were in practice doing that, if they know that uh, hardware is buggy? Um, again, I, it feels hard well, to be saying that all developers need to keep track of all the way hardware can go wrong. Well, this came up because um, this stuff is very hard to test, and it's actually slipped through and disabled uh, you know, large scale implementations. Um, but, but, but that would be true of if we were pushing that to developers as well, right? I mean, it means every developer would have to find this really hard to find bugs rather than having the. Uh, not necessarily. They wouldn't necessarily have to know what was going on, but if they were, um, if they got, impl if, once you started seeing indications of problems, like, you know, massive, massive issues. Um, that users are experienced, you could just flip the switch and just turn the stuff off. And then, uh, so it's kind of a, think of it as a kill switch. I want to add also that sometimes uh, decoders work fine unless you're paired with a specific encoder, uh, which might not be very common. So in some mm. situations that might, you might not have any problems and you just want to disable uh, the encoder on very specific cases, but not just say, I'm going to disable decoder for everyone because right. there might be someone with a broken, uh, with, with an encoder that generates a stream that cannot be decoded. Yeah, so that's kind of the next question, uh, Florent, is uh, like oh, if you yeah. have that case, like this particular encoder is busted, how do I know I've got that one? So um, Yaniva is next on the queue. Uh, yes, so um, for uh, set parameters, I do believe we have read-only properties and we have ways to 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 say uh, when properties can be set or not. So I don't, uh, my concern with putting it in RTC, RTP codec capability is that's actually information that's returned from get capabilities. Mm -hmm. So now, we're, now we would probably double the number of codec entries. Some would be, and the, that's the no, hardware acceleration would, field. Just... It would just but, be for the yeah. profiles you have. Uh, well, actually, I wouldn't expect the question. The other question is, would mm. you even return this um, mm. at all? And um, that's a separate thing. You you might not actually return it from get capabilities. Um, I'm not saying that you necessarily would. Uh, it doesn't seem to fit well because uh, the way you've shown the the web IDL here, you you're adding an accel hardware acceleration preference to information about a codec, and it's not the codec that has a preference, but uh, it's. And also, we just spent uh, a large amount of time 
moving some of the fingerprinting concerns over to media session. So I'm, I'm, and we talked about retiring the ability to detect hardware in WebRTC. So we've done the opposite though with media it. capabilities that we're, we're providing more information on, on what you have. Yes, but we've lumped in the, the sensitive information into the existing category of media sessions to get it out of the WebRTC working group domain. Right. So now that we're reintroducing, I want to make sure we don't reintroduce uh, potential concern that people might have uh, again, uh, if, unless there's a good reason. And it, maybe it would be better. It doesn't seem necessary to include that information here if we could instead uh, phrase it as a preference, which I think is easier to do in set parameters. So, uh, so we have Johannes as the, as the media capabilities expert. He's next on the queue. Uh, yeah, thanks. So um, uh, I, I guess the way I understand this is that it should just be some way for like a short term. Okay, there was a bug in the browser, and then the developer could then disable the hardware uh, encoding or decoding for some short period down, uh, until it's fixed in the browser. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think from that sense, I wonder. Or to me, it seems like it maybe doesn't have to influence that, like the media capabilities API, what's, what's returned mm -hmm. from that. It's more like, okay, this is something, instead of having everything, every, everything broken, you get like, like some kind of recovery mode or something. But, but I, I, I agree also that uh, it seems a bit uh, hard for the developers to use it, but I understand the concern that it, it it's very tricky to test it. So, that's a sense I understand that it may be useful still to have this API. So putting myself on the queue. And so one of the things I wonder about is uh, the places people want to do this, this particular thing, routing around bugs is uh, for specific implementations of the codec. And uh, that requires that they know the, impl the imp implementation of a codec. O otherwise, they will be overcompensating and just uh, disabling this stuff blindly. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do wonder whether my MIDI cap built this is the right, right way to go, because, because that's where we can actually surface information about um, about the implementation without uh, mm -hmm. increasing fingerprinting surface too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the place where you'd find out if it's smooth, power efficient, and supported. Yeah, um, and we, if, you, if we were also going to be told that uh, this is the Android uh, me media, uh, this is a Samsung, uh, the Samsung hardware encoder with uh, with uh, software version th thirty five. That might be the version, the information you need to to know for certain that you're going to get it, that you don't want to use it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that fits well with the current way of doing mitigate build this. Well, how is Uh, no, it, it seems a bit, uh, I'd say, uh, complicated to get it in there. Uh, I, I asked, asked another question. I'm not sure. I mean, this, this seems to be quite browser specific still. What browse, what bugs there are? I mean, mm -hmm. may, I, mean I, I probably, I mean, it could work well maybe in Firefox and, and Sony Chromium that has a bug or vice versa. Uh, I was just, just think, thinking of, because we have this kind of block list for certain hardware and, and um, such, I was just thinking if if, if if it would be worth uh, investigating the, the possibility to just be able to uh, like download block list on the fly somehow that are browser per browser. Yeah. yeah, so that that you quickly can get out this kind of information. Okay, now we have a certain bug in in this uh, for this particular hardware encoder. 
without without having to, having to wait for, for another release. That's a good question. Uh, Ryu. Yeah, uh, Ryu here. So I uh, say that, yes, the uh, the block list which uh, is used in Chrome, something like that, GPU driver, buglets, just JSON, those are the ones which we use, uh, give information to our driver teams because uh, most of these issues are driver issues, as you know, and uh, our driver teams basically look at that JSON file inside the Chrome browser and try to fix uh, platform by platform. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're running out of time. Do we have a kind of recommended uh, resolution other, th other than to go to GitHub and continue to uh, noodle on it there? Seems to me we don't have a resolution. We have okay. a couple of uh, approaches beyond the ones that we're uh, that has already been outlined, so. Okay, so I'll uh, give the floor to you, Harold, for issue 99. Yep, so now I'm not watching the queue anymore. So okay. this is about uh, the RTC RTP header extension capabilities that we're hoping that we can get out to shipping soon. So scenario, you have an implementation, it support SNASI extension number five. It uh, provides uh, dancing videos. By default, not set in offers. Since it, the browser is capable of it, it's listed in capabilities. But uh, when you create an offer, it's not there, and you don't know why. Now, is this a problem? If it is a problem, then we should make the surface the information somewhere. This, this isn't done by default. If it isn't a problem, we don't need to change anything. When I started writing the slides, I kind of thought, hmm, when you create an offer and do this at local description dance and so on, uh, you can get the information out there by querying what kept what extension capabilities have I set after you, after I've set the default? So you can expect basically inspect the offer using the API or using some some SDP extension. So we might not need this. Question is, do we need it? Uh, I guess is anyone asking for it? <laughs> well, Bernard. I yeah, I um, I think it's a convenience, uh, in the in the use case you describe right there, and there will uh, there will be scenarios like this where you don't want to set it on by default, um, and yet uh, you would like to understand why. Um, so I don't know that it's absolutely required, but it does seem like it could be, could be a convenience to, to the developer. Because otherwise, they, they'd have to inspect the offer, as you say on the slide. And Jan Niva is next, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I would say if this is for debugging, I think looking at the STP is fine. But if this is something that we imagine applications writing conditional code for, that would, that would probably need an API. Like it, it's someone going to write code that bakes in some, like if, this doesn't show up, then I'm going to do this instead. Yeah, the, the, the most probable example would probably be that if the browser doesn't offer transport CC, then I'm going to fall back to uh, some other congestion control. I think you can shim this by doing doing some uh, some negotiation, uh, creating an offer and dancing this uh, and, and doing a dance uh, by with a throwaway pay connection. 
so that you can actually query the result of negoti negotiating it. But uh, I'm, I'm lazy. I don't want to change anything. So I don't hear any strong opinions. I mean, vaguely for and vaguely, vaguely for. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I guess my sense is that if there is a big demand for it, it sounds cheap to do. If there is no demand for it, it sounds expensive to do. So maybe it's a matter of getting the voice of uh, developers to say how, how big an issue this is for now. And, and like the idea, I think, could be brought up later if it's not a now problem. And if it is, then we can iterate. So if we if we don't decide to add it now, we'll ship the API without it, basically. Maybe that's the right question to ask. What would be the cost if of shipping this addition later rather than now? Like, would, can can we design this? later as a backwards compatible change or not? The sketch I had in the bug was, uh, it would be backwards compatible. It would just be an extra member showing up. So yes, it's possible to add later. Okay. So, Proposal such a uh, close close has no change, and we're approximately on schedule. I think. Okay. So we're gonna turn the floor over to Elad. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so I'm here to talk about the Hall of Mirrors, which is what happens when you capture a surface draw it back to the surface from which you're capturing it and capture it recursively like that. So uh, some of us have already tried, for example, sharing a single monitor and you're, uh, you see a preview of the monitor or a window or a tab. And specifically, I'm mostly thinking about tab, but this applies to uh, all three of those. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, uh, you can get into that for in several ways. And the problems that this creates are that it confuses the local user, it confuses the remote uh, remote users, and it can potentially even produce mic howl, which is when you get a feedback loop on your mic, and or on you know on the uh, whatever you're capturing, and nobody benefits, right? It usually happens by mistake, except when it's not actually a mistake. But then uh, during um, during video conferencing, if you capture the current tab, that's usually a mistake. Next slide, please. Uh, um, uh, just a second, a word before that. So uh, one of the reasons that I'm focusing on uh, tab is that if you're capturing the current win uh, the current monitor, then that is usually not a mistake, right? Usually the intention is, okay, you capture the entire monitor, but then you quickly switch away from the video conference to something else, and that's a bit more, uh, that's um, a more interesting case, a bit more, um, uh, a bit more delicate. So I'm only talking about when you capture the current tab. So one solution that uh, you could think of is you could say, okay, so how about the user agent does don't offer the current tab? And I argue that this would be a mistake because uh, there are legitimate applications that offer the user to capture the current tab and that is actually desirable. So for example, if you want to take a screenshot of the current uh, application and file feedback, uh, I know there are some applications that are experimenting exactly with that. Um, so you would want to allow the user to capture the current tab. Also, if you're recording something, like for example, if Google Meet didn't offer recording on the cloud, one of us might have recorded this entire meeting using uh, using current tab capture. And so long as we didn't actually, uh, that the person did not preview the whatever they were capturing back to the screen, there would be no hall of mirrors. So self-capture would be quite legitimate and unproblematic then. 
And I could come up with a couple of additional examples, but I think my point is made for now. Next slide, please. So given that the previous solution uh, was not really desirable, what else could we do? And uh, I think that if we remember, get display media gets this dictionary and we can extend the dictionary with another member. It can be include current tab, it can be exclude current tab, it could be a couple of other shapes that we can discuss in soon. It can have a default value, maybe it doesn't, but the point is it's gonna be a control that allows you to hint to the user agent whether you want to see the current tab as one of the options or not. And next slide, please. So then we come to the inevitable security discussion, and that is that whenever we think about influencing user selection, a lot of red uh, red lights turn on and start, and uh, ominous music uh, starts playing. And we need to ask if this uh, reasonable this time. Is that something that we should worry about this time? And I would argue that in this case, this is not actually problematic, because the problem with uh, influencing user selection comes in two flavors. One of them is when you can uh, influence the user towards selecting a display surface that is under your control, in which case you can embed there anything you want, and that's going to be a problem. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I won't be able to read the, this uh, during the uh, thing, Yaniver. Uh, so the other uh, problem is when you, uh, when you influence the user towards something that might not be under your control, but is either inherently dangerous, like maybe it's the entire screen, or maybe it's something sensitive to begin with, like a specific tab with your bank account that might not be under your control, but you want to get that. And I argue that in this very limited case of saying, I don't want to capture the current tab, you're actually moving the user away from those two cases, in which case the usual concerns we have about influencing user choice no longer apply. Next slide, please. So then, um, assuming that we um, assuming that we agree on all of this, which is an assumption that we will soon test, uh, we would have to ask the question: Okay, but what is the default value going to be? And after a couple of discussions on GitHub, I think that maybe the best thing to do is just to say, you know what, there is no uh, default value. This is a hint. Each user agent will choose to interpret its the lack of it as they want which is the current case, by the way. Right now, there is nothing saying whether the user agent must include the current tab or not, and we won't be changing that. Uh, next slide, please. And then some foreshadowing, like we won't jump directly into this, but if we manage to uh, make some progress on this right now, then maybe we can even expand the scope and say, okay, do we want something similar for excluding the current window and excluding the current uh, screen? But this is probably something that we would want to potentially get to if we have time. So if you could go one, back one or two slides, and then I'll uh, mute myself and listen uh, for people, two people. Yeah, uh, I'm Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. I'm actually not sure what we're deciding here. I mean, there's an issue. Uh, this is issue 209 that has more detail. And um, uh, what is being proposed here? What I'm proposing as uh, one slide uh, backwards, please. Exactly. So I suggest that we add either include current tab or exclude current tab. It is not important to me which one it is, so long as we don't have a default value. And that one serves as a hint. It basically says user uh, to, tells the user agent that the application is not interested or is interested in potentially getting the current tab. Oh, thank and, you. Yes. So, sorry. Uh, I'm listening. OK. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, um, I like this API, other than I think the default need, uh, should be false, because I think that's the of all the sites that use uh, screen capture, I think most sites would rather, let me back up. I don't actually think this is about um, avoiding the hall of mirrors. I think that's a symptom uh, that could be mitigated with other things like uh, UN mentioned, you know, um, uh, having the user agents uh, block 
that the view of that or blur it or do other tricks with the video. <clears throat> but I think the use case is actually um, that picking your own tab is often undesirable in many applications, like in, in this meeting here, um, module the self-recording uh, thing, which I think isn't the primary use case there. Uh, but I think long-term we want uh, self-capture to be uh, get viewport media and uh, get display media capture of everything else. And I think most sites would be fine with that. So I would argue that it's actually desirable to, um, so the question comes down to, yes, there are some sites that, that want self-capture to be part of the option and I, they should be allowed to express that. So I think include current tab is the right uh, Boolean for that. But I, I think the default is also important. I think the default should be false. Also, there's a W3C design principle that says that uh, Booleans cannot default to true uh, because, um, and it's well explained in, in issue 209 that I link to the tag guidance on that. <clears throat> now, that has to do with, uh, you always, you don't want undefined to accidentally um, do the opposite of what the web developer um, thinks they're doing. Uh, so, so if we wanted to have a, a default uh, behavior of true, which I don't want. Uh, we would I have think to we agree it. on the we, we agree on the on the point of the true, and that's why it could either be include or exclude current tab, and we need to discuss that. Right. Um, yes, I'm sorry, <clears throat> Dom. Uh, did you want to say something? You end this on the queue too. Um, how do we do with this? Like, should the UN go next, or should I respond to what Yanivar has said? Because there are five different points he has made, and I would not be able to remember all five, and then all of you ends. Uh, oh, respond first. Okay, uh, so first of all about default true, thank you very much for bringing it to uh, my attention. And yes, I think that we agree there. Uh, about UN's suggestion of obfuscation, as he called it, uh, that uh, applies more to whole screen capture, but not for current uh, screen capture, a uh, current tab capture, because if you're capturing the current tab and you obfuscate that, then you're capturing nothing. So that's a bit less interesting. Uh, so specifically for current uh, tab, you are correct that Hall of Mirrors is not the only case. This is more of a symptom. The case is that we are capturing something that you're not actually uh, situated to handle, right? Like for example, um, if you want just to work, we understand. Uh, so given that you like this API and that the only thing that we dis uh, potentially disagree about is the default, uh, I would say that we should probably not take get viewport media into account when making this decision, because we have no idea how long it's going to uh, take for it to be adopted uh, by uh, the W3C, implemented, and then adopted by web developers. And there is a significant risk of it being adopted by web developers because it requires two different mechanisms, which are not terribly common nowadays. So it could be that not many web developers would be able to use that API. So I don't think that we should use it as a guiding principle just yet. I do think that we should avoid breaking current applications that potentially have millions of users. Even if it's only for two days, I think that's undesirable. And I think that for that reason, we should just not have a default value. Well, um, that doesn't change anything actually because it's a Boolean, so there's going to be a default behavior. But I'm actually going to <clears throat> clarify that um, I, can, I can separate this from what implementations are doing because implementations Excuse me. User agents are already allowed to to provide any choices they want. It's totally up. Uh, the specification doesn't add any limitations there. What we're talking about here, I think, is a hint from the application and the shape of that hint. We can either find out which applications uh, want the current tab, or we can find out which applications don't want the current tab, independent of how the browsers work. <clears throat> and I argue that out of 100 applications, I think 99 would not want, expect or have any use for capture of the current tab and one application would have use for it. So I think it would be better to have the default behavior uh, apply to the 99 and have the one application include, uh, specify include current tab, please, true. I, I don't Thanks. know how you got to the numbers of 99 out of 100. I think that if we spoke to one of those applications that do want it, they would give different estimations. Uh, I can tell you that I've got some histograms and self-capture happens millions of times per year. Uh, presumably a significant portion of that is not accidental. 
Uh, so we should go on with the UN and DOM. UN? Yeah. <laughs> um, so first about the security issues. Um, uh, I would say that in general that security issues related to tap capture in the current spec, uh, the current spec is not really dealing with it. It's very light and it's it's start it's starting to to feel I, I I'm starting to feel some pain there because we uh, there are some proposals that are uh, more and more trying to control to allow a web page to control what the browser will will show so what the user will pick and the more we are adding uh, in terms of uh, such control the more we need to provide guidelines to precisely tell hey tab capture is tab capture is very specific so you need to deal with it in uh, in very very good ways and we, we we really need to to provide more guidelines there so if we proceed with uh, this uh, to me uh, we in parallel really need to uh, provide more guidelines um, I think Chrome already did did some guidelines already did some mitigations so it would be good to uh, to, to provide uh, such mitigations um, or at least uh, expose what, what are the issues uh, in general as long as uh, this is a hint it's fine my understanding though is that uh, I'm not pretty clear about it but some implementations may see the hint and then they might remove entirely the possibility for uh, the um, user to actually select the tab and if so that's something new uh, because currently as I understand it the hints are only allowing user to to push the user towards uh, what is the, the more meaningful choice but still the user with a few clicks can change like oh no I really don't want to tap capture I actually want window capture and that's still something feasible with the current hints with this hint it's not clear to me whether we will change this so uh, that's that's some point that I want to highlight as well uh, and, and third, related to uh, Hall of Mirror, I don't think that this is solving Hall of Mirror at all, uh, clearly. It's, uh, it's, it's a different problem. Uh, it's, it might be fine to add the support for input current tab, but still it's a completely different uh, problem. And some native applications have actually implemented uh, some blurring of uh, uh, current tab um, to, to solve the issue when you're sharing your screen or window and, and so on. And for current tab, uh, if you have it and you're not happy with having the whole current tab because it's doing a whole of mirror, you can always group to what, what is meaningful in your page uh, or ask the user to, uh, to select again, which would be really sad. Um, so I really think that for whole of mirror, we should keep the, the issue open and uh, pursue it as a follow-up. And uh, there might be uh, some efforts or some uh, some energy that we could provide there. So I must admit that I, I was listening to all that and I couldn't tell whether you were arguing for or against this particular extension. Um, as I said, uh, according to the use case, and it's if it's only a hint, then that's fine. In the GitHub issue, it was working with a hint or whether at some point we would say you must remove the entry. And I really think we should not go there currently. So as long as it's a hint, and what a clarification would be, uh, for instance, is Chrome planning to remove the entry altogether if uh, the Boolean flag is true? Um, if that's the case, maybe we'll go in with interrupt issues at some point because Safari might not do the same. So that's that's the tiny bit there where I'm, uh, I would be uh, a little cautious about this API. But in, we, in general, uh, otherwise, that's fine. Uh, in order to answer the, the uncertainty that you've just voiced, could we go to uh, two slides forward, uh, please? So I'm suggesting the bold text at the bottom, and that is most definitely a hint. And I understand that maybe we need to rephrase it a bit, but what do you think about this general direction? Um, yeah, it's... Uh... It's different from what I understood from the GitHub issue, but th this is uh, much better uh, and that, that looks better to me. So it's better, but are you supportive of this? Uh, as long as we uh, provide more security guidelines related to tab capture, to the difference between current tab capture and 
of the tab captures and so on, uh, 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 I, would, I will be supporting. Is it possible and, and for you maybe issue, to... And we keep the issue open for uh, actually solving all of the neurons as well. Is, so, uh, of course, we can uh, keep the issue because this only partially uh, addresses, it mitigates, so we can definitely do more work. Uh, is it possible for you maybe to kickstart the effort of elaborating security concerns that you uh, worry about? Um, I think that um, the Chrome team and the Chrome UI has done extensive work there. So it would be good if you could, uh, uh, for instance, express uh, what mitigations Chrome did for uh, tab capture because you're the one that actually uh, did the implementation. And you're the one who are proposing to uh, allow a web page to more, more easily select tabs, which, are, which have their own issues. So, and you, you have done things like, uh, for instance, if the page is navigating away, you're making it clear in origins and, and so on, and we, which are really great uh, information. And so you're way ahead of uh, what Safari is doing because Safari is not implementing tab capture. So uh, I can certainly find an issue, but I think that uh, in terms of thoughts and how, how much mitigations uh, so, have been done, it, it should be Chrome that, that does. Yeah, so we, we have four minutes left on this issue, so uh, done. And then yeah, so in terms of Boolean default values, uh, a simple way, if this is an issue, is to move to an enum value, which happens to have two values. So I don't think we should get stuck on that design consideration. Uh, I'm personally supportive of this uh, hint. Um, as long as it is a hint, really, then um, we are just helping the UA provide the best, smoothest user experience. Um, and so I'm supportive of uh, that direction. I, I agree that if we can get some of the great guidance <laughs> from Chrome on how to make this space easier to implement for everyone, we'll get more progress overall. So I would also support UN's request in that space. Sure, and UN, I would love to do that work, uh, only I'm not fully uh, sure what you mean? So if you just help me later, out of band, just let me know specifically what you're talking about, and you know, just file an issue. Tell me what specifically you're yeah, and, referring and to. File an issue. Thank you. So uh, I think the conclusion of this point was that we uh, we will continue discussing. It seems that people who are arguing about it uh, want to want to go for making this a hint. And, uh, and not uh, total uh, never show this tab, but uh, people are generally positive towards uh, something like this. Okay, next issue. Display surface hinting. Hello uh, again. minutes. I think Intel was supposed to be in between. Uh, okay, I see uh, Bomik, I, I see you we, around. We, uh, we rearranged things a bit since hopefully this will be short. Okay, so I hope so. You, you do have additional time for this a lot. Don't have to do it in two minutes. Okay, uh, I'll try to do it in two minutes anyway, why not? Uh, so uh, we've discussed for a long time a similar issue to the one just uh, um, just uh, introduced. So let's please keep them separate. Okay. So what everything we've discussed right now, separate, new issue. Another problem uh, that sometimes uh, happens is that the application wants to hint to the user agent that it is especially well geared to handle windows or uh, tabs or something like that. Uh, and this there are all sorts of ways that we could do that but the question of there's the question of how and there's the question of should we do it and hopefully by now we've already agreed that we should and that it is helpful because it can help to actually push the user towards tabs which are inherently safer than for example the window that contains the tab right because then for example you're not sharing the url bar and the history uh, and maybe the set of extensions you have and some of your bookmarks. So generally, if you are going to share a browser, better to share a tab. And there were a lot of other reasons for why we might want to do that. And now after nine months of discussing the latest iteration, uh, I hope that we could give birth to this particular proposal. And because we've been unable to really completely convince each other about which way to implement this, 
I suggest that we compromise on the average of everything, uh, the least change. So in my mind, this is to A, not introduce any new mechanisms, to use the current mechan established mechanisms, whether we like them or not, namely constraints. I think this is also good for web developers because they often file bugs on Chrome saying, hey, this constraint doesn't work. So obviously they already expect this to work. Uh, so that's number one. And number two is I think that we should keep this a hint and stay as open-ended about how this hint is to be interpreted by the user agent. Um, what do you think? You were? Uh, hint is fine. I think that there's a compromise where we could say that underneath it's a constraint. We are reusing the constraint mechanism, but we change a bit the web ideal that is exposed so that we remove all the craft uh, that constraints bring in terms of web ideal. And that would allow, for instance, whenever you are using exact, it would just be dis disregarded. You're, you're, you're skipping it. You don't care about it. And this way you, you keep it constraints like everything you're, you're happy and so on, but still we're making things uh, much simpler and uh, much, much more straightforward. So you mean, do you mean reject if it's exact, but uh, I forgot the word, but preferred no, no, or optimal? No. Okay. Basically exact will not, would not be defined. So it would be seen as any uh, other field like exact two or exact Z and so on. So it, it would be ignored and it would not be visible uh, after you pass to web idea. And, and we can simplify things a little bit this way. I would uh, strongly argue, uh, strongly propose not making this that part of this proposal, but uh, that's uh, that's because I hate uh, irregularities. Um, to, we have Janiver, of course. Uh, yes, I agree with Harold on this one. Uh, I think uh, exact is already a type error in Get Display Media, so. Get display media is already, I think we did a good job of narrowing down the constraints mechanism. There's no advanced, there's no exact, there's no uh, min. Um, there is max uh, for some reasons. Um, so it, since it's already operating on a reduced version of constraints, I think uh, the issues that you mentioned aren't that um, serious, uh, as severe for users. And that I, I, so I agree with using the display surface here uh, because it already exists, it's already specified, and if implementations haven't implemented it, uh, if it's not showing up in get constraints, uh, it's because implementations haven't implemented it the way they should. So I think this is a good use of that. Um, as to the text proposed, I do believe there's some detail lost in the issue that I think um, I would be okay with this if we add that. Uh, my concern is that applications that use this to, to ask for monitor for instance, like uh, use cases, uh, schools where teachers want to see the entire screen of the desktop of the user. That that's sort of that's not a use case. I feel is something we should be providing. That's a level of control uh, that um, is not conducive to uh, best interests of the user, which I, in this case will be the student. Um, so I think the uh, it, I think we. Uh, I think I proposed some language that uh, user agents should steer users away from from monitor capture would be appropriate here. So uh, if it is something relatively uh, non-committal like should, then maybe we can talk about this, but I think that this is not actually helping because user agents might otherwise. Uh, so currently in a relatively big implementation, Chrome, the default is um, monitor, and we would all like to move away from this. And an off-ramp would be to allow this to be maintained as, you know, as a hint that slowly gets deprecated if there isn't enough pushback. We've discussed this on the issue. And um, I feel that also if we just keep it minimal, we don't need to discuss monitor. Firefox will not uh, respect the hint uh, for monitor and hopefully Chrome can one day stop respecting that one too. And at that point, we can either add this uh, language or just keep ignoring it because it is implicit from the fact that it's a user agent decision whether to regard the hint or not. And I think that would be an easy compromise, right? So, 
Well, that's why I propose should. Otherwise, I would propose must. Yeah. So I think with the should, Chrome should be able to uh, do the off ramp you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I see Domi's on the queue. Yeah. Again, this is a hint. Um, so what Elad described as, you know, you can do it or you cannot do it. Um, like Firefox is in a position to take a better approach by default. Uh, Personally, I feel that's good enough. I, I don't at all object to having the should, but with a hint, uh, hinting on the hint feels also maybe uh, a bit too much. Like, I mean, I, again, I, if there can be consensus on having the should, great, but, but I, I think overall, uh, we are like so close to solving an issue that is so important to so many people that, that I wouldn't want us to get stuck on whether or not to include this guidance. I, I think with a hint, we give uh, enough latitude for the right thing to happen. Uh, at the end of the day, to be more specific, if Chrome, uh, which is the one that uh, would need to uh, fail on this should, feels that it's not helping, helpful to have this should, uh, I'm not sure we gain much with having it. So. Uh, yes, to, uh, to support what Dom just said, I think that if we have a should that in is later disregarded, uh, that is th that does not serve anybody, right? It just confuses web developers. So I think that we would be better off without it. Yeah. I don't. I, I disagree there. Um, a spec is used to for imp by implementers. So if you are a new implementer, and there will be new implementations, then people will implement it and will uh, allow monitor by default. And then at some point they will figure out, oh no. Then the spec should really have told me that I should have actually ignored it. And specs are also good for that. So the should will uh, actually solve uh, that for a new implementers. So Chrome is an existing implementer, so does, does not really care about the should. Interesting. Um, I see there's some merit in this point, yes. So is it that we can agree on the should and agree on the overall approach then? I think, um, how about the following compromise? What if we have no normative language explaining to implementers that um, a lot of respect in a monitor uh, hint comes uh, at risk and that it's better to not do that? Sounds good to me. You okay. I, I don't see the problem with the should, though. I mean, it, this allows Chrome. Chrome stated uh, a valid reason, I think, that they wanted to deal with web compatibility, and the should should allow that without compromising the the guidance of the spec. Right? Yeah, to me, should should is exactly for for your use case there, where you you want to do it, but it might be difficult. So. Um. Okay, um, so am I hearing that uh, modulo the should issue, everything else uh, we agree on? Um, I, I'm not agreeing yeah, on the okay. surface, but uh, on the API surface, but uh, uh, <laughs> I, won't, I, won't, I won't discuss it there again. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, am I hearing that although we're not happy with anything, we're actually okay with everything, modulo should? <laughs> Sounds like Sounds a... Good. Yeah. So should I re record that as a resolution then? Uh, the way I understand this, you and please correct me if I'm wrong. If we take the current text and just add the uh, point of should, then you would accept this. Uh, I would still try to convince you on the GitHub issue, but I guess I will fail. But otherwise, yeah. Okay. Uh, I heard the yeah. Uh, Yanivar? Uh, yes. Awesome. Anybody else? Cool. Uh, I don't have a gavel. Okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. Got any more? We have a decision. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so this is actually not an ask <clears throat> from the working group. It's just a reminder that uh, we finally have a PR up on Get Viewport Media. So we would like to do a call for adoption. So please have a look at that link at your convenience after the meeting. Uh, just a quick recap. It's uh, It looks very much like it 
display media, it's, except it's called get viewport media. It returns the same promise, takes the same constraints, and uh, the it captures the top level browsing context viewport, which is more commonly known as the current tab, uh, even from an iframe. And it's uh, gated by various security mechanisms like uh, cross origin isolated, uh, a document policy viewport capture. <clears throat> uh, for a while it was called HTML capture, but I think everyone agreed in September to call it viewport capture because then the name view, viewport capture is um, uh, consistent throughout. So there's a document policy viewport capture, require document policy viewport capture for iframes. Uh, there's a user permission viewport capture and a permissions policy for iframe, which is also called viewport capture. And then this also requires transient activation. It has the same privacy indicator requirements and constraints, video and audio as get display media. So we didn't really talk about audio, but I, I feel that there's really no reason to exclude audio. So it is in the current document. So um, any questions about that? Yeah, two, two questions. Otherwise, that's my slide. Yeah. Uh, lo looking at the uh, web ADL, display media stream constraints is probably not what you want. You probably want your own version of uh, viewport media, blah, blah, blah. And the second thing is about audio. Uh, you're capturing the tab. So the question then for audio is whether the audio will be the system audio or whether it will be uh, the current tab audio. And uh, that's something to, to think about. Right, the, the current document actually says it must not, uh, it must not capture system level audio. Uh, I would say that, that it, it should probably do even more. It probably should not even capture any other tab. So it's not just system, mm -hmm. but it, should, it must right. be only from the current tab. Um, I think that's the only sensible thing to do, actually. Is that even that, possible? That was my intent. Yeah. And, if, and if, if it's not capable of isolating the audio for the current tab, then it shouldn't capture audio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that is very much the intent of the document, and uh, I'm happy to clarify that if need be. Uh, just bear in mind for the, there's a, there's a PR, if you look at the document right now, I think it does say HTML captured. That's uh, I didn't merge issue number four, um, so hopefully that'll be merged this Thursday, or before call before call for adoption. Um, any other questions? Uh, this is not a question, but more of a public statement. Um, I would like to say that I think this is. Uh, uh, modulo the uh, specifics, right? The general intent of this is awesome. Uh, I'm very excited by this work and I hope to see this uh, both finalized as well as implemented. Uh, I just want to raise the concern that we don't know whether it's actually going to be adopted by web developers. So I think that we should stay uh, away from uh, avoiding other progress based on the fact that this is upcoming. And I would also like us to keep in mind that if adoption does not happen, we might need to relax a couple of the requirements uh, which might be difficult, but we might need to do so or deprecate the whole thing. So related to that, do, do we have like, uh, did we reach out to some uh, web developers about get report media and in particular the constraints related to uh, cross origin isolation? And whether that uh, would not be, uh, uh, that would not slow down the adoption of this API? I actually did in the beginning of last year, and they told me that they are wholly incapable of uh, adopting this at the time. Uh, at that time, I don't know if this has changed, but at that time, this was a blocker for them. Not naming any names. Yeah, I've heard that as well. Well, I, I agree that uh, I think we're taking the long view here. So uh, I, I'm, I think we're the, the working group has been very open to making uh, a lot of changes to get display media lately uh, with with that understanding. Yeah. Uh, sorry, to, to your comment, uh, UN, about this display media constraints, I think that's mostly editorial. But uh, yes, right now, it, display media constraints fit the bill. Uh, but we can, of course, uh, if there are changes needed uh, for that, we can duplicate that if not, if need be. I don't think we, we need any hint about uh, user surface selection, for instance. Correct.
All right, thanks. All right. Okay, we're a little bit ahead of time, uh, but we're gonna hand the floor over, I guess, is it you, uh, Riju, or? Yeah. Okay. Right, okay. So, yeah, hi all. Uh, we spoke about some of the WebRTC and the features at uh, TPAC 2021, and again, briefly, in the November interim meeting. So now that the initial peers have been out for a while, uh, hopefully this audience had the time to go through uh, the details. So we have a lot of to discuss. So let's deep dive into the face detection. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Well, here's a snapshot of the IDL uh, for the face detection proposal. Uh, I have linked to the full proposal in the notes section, actually, if you click there. Um, we want a way to do face detection natively on browsers instead of you know, cloud-based solutions and the ML framework way to unlock specific like client capabilities. Last time we demoed uh, face detection on Chrome OS and there were a few remarks. So number one, uh, Bernard, her Harald UN wanted face detection to be anchored to video frame uh, defined in web codex instead of the media stream track. I think the PR now reflects that. Uh, number two, uh, the boundary box issue. I think Harald asked was to make the API a bit more general and forward looking, uh, something for the future as well. Uh, not getting fixated only on the present. Specifically, the ask was to return something like a mask instead of a rectangle. We tried to reason a bit, and even though right now there is no platform API supporting a mask, uh, we tried to accommodate this request by returning a contour. The number of points describing the contour can be uh, user-defined, like in that phase detection num contour points um settings and implementation wise right now obviously we default to a four point rectangle i mean discussions with camera driver teams across orgs actually have revealed that underlying face detection algorithms do detect those points but the main pain point has been standardizing the number of counts of this point so that's why they are not yet putting up a standardized platform api uh, the next task was something very similar, like uh, since a few frameworks do return face mesh, like the uh, TensorFlow returns a 468 landmark fa uh, face mesh, uh, can we have that also? So we have reworked it, the face detection mode to uh, non-presence, contour, and mesh. Again, uh, mesh is not possible right away on the platform but i think uh, like for the sake of extensibility we have put it up for discussion uh number four was uh, face expressions uh it did not get much support from the audience last time so i guess it was on everybody's mind but tim had voiced that uh, face expressions was more subjective and there's a concern about the expression detection going wrong. Um, we have removed them from the PR totally. Maybe maybe in future, we could add blink and smile only. Uh, the other, the entire list I kept, uh, maybe it's not yet ready for prime time, but uh, as of now in the PR, I have removed the entire uh, expressions. We can add later if things improve. Uh, Number five ask was to make sure face detection works with the transform stream. Uh, so we put up an example. I think it's in the next slide. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Yeah, we, I, we put up an example, uh, mostly uh, to show how face detection and transform team and workers can work together. And uh, yeah, and lastly, I think the last point which I remember is uh, I think I said I will bring up some PNP numbers to validate some you know 
claims. Unfortunately, I could not get the permission to show official numbers on a public forum, but uh, let's say uh, unofficially, we can say that uh, around uh, it's half of the time, like uh, half of power is needed for phase detection. Uh, we have done only on Chrome OS system, so uh, compared it versus media pipe. Uh, obviously, uh, 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 before Chrome upstreaming, we'll be uh, sharing the uh, numbers, you know, proper proper numbers. So, I mean, from a, we just quickly hacked and got the power consumption as say two wattage for the total system power while doing the phase detection, our POC. And when we did it, the same resolution of, on media pipe, it was around 3.25 to 3.5 wattage. Yeah, but uh, you will uh, bring better like uh, official numbers soon. Uh, I uh, Do I continue with phase detection a bit more than take the examples or uh, how, how do you want? Uh, can we open it to questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I have some, some questions. Um, in general, I think that uh, it's good to expose it in video frame. It would also be good to expose this kind of metadata uh, to request video frame callback metadata as well, uh, so, so that you can uh, do that with Canvas as well as if you have a stream of video frames. Uh, so that, that's something that uh, I would hope is not controversial and we, we could do that. Uh, in your example, I see that you were using exact constraints and exact constraints are evil. So uh, I would think that all these constraints would uh, not allow exact actually. Um, and <clears throat> My general question would be, um, so there, there seem to be like several switches and uh, a possibility to provide parameters to the camera so that they can tune uh, their algorithms and, and so on. And I, I was wondering whether uh, in general camera, uh, I was wondering why we need like several switches and not just have one single switch. Uh, in the case where the camera is either exposing data or not exposing data, but it's not like uh, trying to disable an algorithm, re-enable an algorithm and so on. So uh, are you expecting based on these constraints that some algorithms will kick in or will be disabled and so on? So, and why there should be multiple constraints or would it be fine to just have a single switch telling, hey, oh. I, I want to learn about uh, face detection. So please provide me whatever you're grabbing your camera sensor. Right, so there is, a, 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 you want a single switch, like is phase detection supported? Something like that? Uh, it, it's more uh, a, a general question of why there are multiple switches and whether a single switch would not be simpler and good enough in general. And then if we have just one single switch, then it's up to the web application to uh, read what is available and do what it can with the provided data by, by the sensor. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, um, let's say, um, well, uh, for example, the contour points right now, uh, there's not, not such support. So it looks a bit superfluous maybe right now, but, uh, just for like to accommodate the ask about future and all those things we added that way. So, I mean, uh, if, if you're looking at this example and you're saying that, okay, this plus supports dot phase detection norm, it's super clueless. I guess that's what the meaning is, right? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I, I could see, I don't really understand why phase detection name counterpoints would, would be four, for instance. It seems like your web page and you're trying to provide some parameters to the camera sensor. But my understanding was mostly like the camera sensor is anyway doing something, is providing yes. some data, and the idea mm -hmm. is to expose that data. 
Yes, and, that is the idea. So yeah, in the, in, yeah. So I'm wondering why this parameter, why all these parameters? Then? Um. Uh, okay. So the the issue is with the example a bit, I guess, not with the. Uh, so can we can we go a bit as uh, 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 previous slide, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, what I mean is, Johan, um, is there uh, like, do you think uh, this idea looks fine to you, or you think this is too much information, or, or like too too much superfluous data? Um, I, I don't know enough about all the camera systems that are available. Right. So right. That, that's why I'm asking you yeah. yes. really yeah. that kind of information. Um, right. So uh, I can say that right now the contour mesh uh, is not at all exposed, but we added these, kept these things for extensibility. So, uh, but uh, say landmarks and ID and probability, these three are things the driver uses. ID is specifically for face tracking. Uh, probability is like, what is the probability that it's a human face? And landmarks is like left, uh, like nose, eyes. So these three are totally present there. The contour and mesh, not yet there, but um, they're working on it, let's say in future. So we wanted to keep it there, but uh, because there was ask about future extensibility, that's why we kept it there. I see. But so, so, so may, maybe that that means that enums are, are fine, but maybe we could like uh, and dictionaries are fine as well because enums and okay. dictionaries are extensible. But maybe mm -hmm. we can reduce to uh, what is uh, implementable right now and make sure that what comes comes next will be a, will be uh, like the structure we are using will be uh, extensible enough for those cases. Yeah, that was the point with the contour because uh, implementation wise, we would, if we use uh, num, like number of contour points equal to four, it means a rectangle, which is implementable right now. The, the platform API, the, the people in the camera drivers in different organizations, so they are unable to standardize the number of points as of now. That's why they cannot expose that as a platform API because everybody has to, let's say Microsoft, Google, Apple, everybody has to agree on, okay, uh, to have a good uh, algorithm, everything, we, we would standardize on 16 points, but that agreement is not yet there. So, uh, so that's why there's no platform API for the contour points, but uh, hopefully in future it's going to work that way. But uh, uh, you were actually right in the thinking that uh, this uh, the camera is anyways using uh, the face detection to improve its uh, three algorithms, and we are taking those things from the stream. So that way you are right. So we, we have quite a queue, so maybe we should move on. Okay. Um, Bernard, I think you're next. Right. Um, so I, I just wanted to uh, ask some kind of very high level questions about the uh, API surface. So the reason I understand this is the way it is, is because what you're trying to do through the supported constraints is essentially provide uh, and capabilities is, is to provide uh, basic parameters for the algorithm, which you set in the driver. And then essentially the, uh, you now have uh, video frame dot uh, detected faces because it's it's already been done by the drivers you specified. Is that, is that right? Yes, so the driver is actually doing the work beforehand. We need to on like implementation wise, we need to on the face detection beforehand like uh right uh, 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 yeah 
Yeah, so if, that's why if, it was done this way as opposed to uh, having like a promise based uh, method that would give you, you know, to which you would provide the parameters um, is essentially it's it's kind of in, uh, it's dependent on the driver. So if your camera driver doesn't support this, you're not going to have the uh, you're, you're not going to have it basically. No. Yeah, the promise thing. What, uh, what if we do through the promise thing? Then we will have to call something called detect phase, and then the uh, let's say implementation wise, it won't be great, uh, right? Because it's it's going to call again what the driver has already done. Uh, right. Right. So okay. Yeah, hey, I just I, wanted to understand overall why they're okay. designing this as it is. Okay. Right. Thank you. Like if you want more detail on that, I can tell uh, at least for the Windows part, what happens is if you do through the promise way, you'll use something like face analysis. Whereas if you use this way, you'll use something called MF, like uh, Microsoft MDFT stuff. And uh, there will be no, uh, like if I, if I do through face analysis, there will be, uh, duplicate cost for compute it cannot take advantage of implementation details right. like using lower resolution for video handling sub uh, orientation of subjects and using camera roi all these kind of things so that's why this way all right i think i'm next on the queue um so I think uh, you answered some of this uh, from Bernard's question in that this is, sounds like it's a camera API. Not, I mean, it's on media stream track on video frame, but it sounds like this would only be available if the source is a camera. Is that right? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, so my yeah. so th th that's what I thought. So uh, my concern there is that there's also, uh, uh, there's another, uh, effort in the WICG, which is the accelerated right. shape detection and images API. So I'm wondering how this. Yes. My sure. concern is that if if that effort uh, is also ongoing, it will right. be unfortunate if JavaScript has to write things one way if the source is a camera and a different way if the source right. is something else like photos so, or images. Of course. Uh, let me. Uh, say that of course shape detection is incubated in wicg and provides a way to detect faces and of course there's a concern about duplication of effort so let's start by calling out the differences uh, shape detection obviously works only on images not on stream uh, you can call it multiple times inside transform but I, it's not an efficient way to do this there is no face tracking available which means uh, i mean face tracking is is a very handy way to uh, detect across frames and make those uh, efficient. Uh, like I said uh, just before, uh, under the hood, a uh, shape detection is actually using uh, face analysis, uh, the Windows API, which which has a total duplicate cost for compute, uh, cannot take advantage of lower resolution cannot automatically handle orientation and cannot use camera ROI to help 3A. So these are all implementation details I understand. And uh, um, uh, so I don't know, I can ask Riley and Miguel if they're planning to continue it because uh, uh, Intel was our team initially put up the Chrome patches for Windows and uh, I think we realized that this is a much better, like uh, in terms of implementation, this is a better way which will give uh, at least the perf results much better. So, uh, and uh, shape detection phase detector is not yet shaped because it works only on uh, Windows as of now. And, uh, and Android maybe not on Chrome OS, so uh, and the work is stopped. Uh, right. Intel actually implemented the Windows part, so. Uh, yes, I think to, in a, and Harold, you can maybe provide more detail, but I think it is accurate to say that WICG work isn't being implemented; it's not going ahead. 
Is that right? I don't. I really can't say. Yeah, Chrome status didn't indicate any any uh, right. activity there. Okay. Ben, right. ben, do you have any information on this one? I'm afraid I don't. Uh, it, uh, I mean, Riley and Miguel were supposed to do. Miguel moved teams, so I can ask Riley. I think uh, he's a bit busy with uh, other stuff. So I think uh, there's, and the implementation was done by my team in Intel. So I think uh, resource-wise, that effort is a bit uh, constrained to move forward. So uh, I think I'm next on the queue, actually. Uh, Go ahead, Harold. Yeah, so I, I reflect a bit on Yaniva's worries. You know that uh, we have functions today that depend on high quality face detection isolation, where background blur is just one of them. And uh, we have a number of other thing, things that go on. And I'm worried about uh, mm. having these different interfaces to solve the same problem, where oh. some of the interfaces are at the moment proprietary and uh, some are claim to be standardized, especially if we get into the situation where the proprietary interfaces are designed to provide much higher fidelity information than uh, what, the, what the standardized interfaces or the proposed standard interfaces can provide. That was one of the reasons why I push back on on uh, making making contours and meshes uh, available in the API. I'm still not happy with the design that uh, seems to be totally focused on uh, on uh, making ac this an access API for for hardware or driver-based resources instead of making uh, uh, this, this uh, re a re representation API that allows us to say, in this video frame, you have the following information objects. It's kind of getting a little bit of that flavor, but uh, with the, the, all the dictionaries and so on are still very much about we have to co configure the camera driver to do this work for us when it oh. would be perfectly acceptable to do it uh, in many cases to do it ourselves right and I was, so, I was a bit surprised about, about about the number that you only gain the factor of less than 50 percent over media over media pipe but uh, on the shape of this i kind of think that this is actually a major new way of treating information about, about media. And uh, I'd like to see this being proposed as a proposal, a proposal, not just as a set of API patches. That is having the explainer, having the use cases, having the having the APIs, having the examples, all that stuff that we want to put together before we right. before, before we say that this is, yes, this is the right API to chain to have. So I'm right. ready. OK, so uh, uh, firstly, uh, the, uh, we don't need to configure driver anything. We put these things contour mesh uh, just to, you know, for extensibility. There's no driver configuration needed. Uh, it, if the if the camera is in auto mode, it automatically happens. So uh, this is mainly for like getting the information and that kind of thing. Uh, regarding examples, uh, uh, I guess you have had a look at the PR. Uh, uh, do you think those examples were okay, or you like? I mean, 
I added more examples later on. I mean, if we could. I mean, I, I see, I see so-called examples last time I looked for it. I did, I did not see examples of what applications you would use this for. What's the problem to be solved? Uh, I mean, I don't know, say Teams web can use this or meet if they want. We do just to clarify. Uh, I guess nobody is asking you to uh, improvise an answer to this. The, the typical approach that has been taken in this group and others is to package answers to this kind of question in an explainer, which would also be needed for a, a tag review sure. uh, down the line. Uh, uh, and I guess that's. I mean, the, what I'm sensing here is. Uh, before we can say whether this is striking the right set of trade-offs, we would need to better understand which use cases this uh, fulfills, which uh, developers are uh, asking for it, and which which of the many options that you're pushing forward are optional or necessary, and so on. So, uh, I guess I'm hearing the need to level up some of the conversations rather than necessarily diving in uh, into the detail API surface. Okay. Um, I I mean, I can obviously quickly write the, I have the things ready. So we can, I can come up with an explainer in GitHub and the, Git, and the explainer should contain examples and use cases and anything else i guess it should be the standard explainer right from uh, w3c i can yeah uh, and maybe we do you and i should uh, meet so that uh, we can figure out the again the also the right uh way of bringing this proposal for review okay. by the group i mean w one of the things that i'm also hearing is that this is big enough a proposal that it should uh like probably be a spec uh, on its own rather than a patch on a patch which is what media capture extensions is uh, today for for better or for worse uh and so again we probably need to figure the logistics uh for how to make that happen as smoothly as possible okay uh but uh specifically from uh, like uh, from this group so you think uh, uh nobody's going to use this <laughs> like, uh, is there a question about uh, whether it's useful or not? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I, uh, I think the question is whether whether it handles all the use cases people might want to use it with. Yeah. Um, sorry to skip the queue, but uh, maybe I can clarify. I, I worry that um, the other specification was dealing with um, you mentioned some benefits this is tied to video frame which i agree has benefits over photo and images but it still feels like tying this to the camera i mean the camera itself provides an, an a necessary function i mean there's no way to simulate the camera and talk well you need to record my face but as far as this feature it sounds like it's going to be obsolete in five or ten years because machines become faster and then a lot of use cases i think would be to uh, um, to do this kind of processing with hardware on uh, sources other than the camera. And that's what I'm missing here. I feel like it might be better to have a, I think uh, a long, longer view API would not focus so much on the hardware acceleration uh, in the, being in the driver, but that this is, would be the way to express uh, what JavaScript wants on the video frame um, that, that, that could be done by, right. by the user agent, for example. Right. I mean, without going to to the implementation detail about exactly if it's doing on camera within the ISP in the CPU or VPU, those things actually are abstracted there. So, uh, but uh, wow. Well, uh, okay. So, so uh, Harald, if I am understanding correctly, you want basically proof that. Uh, background blur, face detection, all these things are going to be uh, at all usable or? Uh, I'm, uh, if... I'd, I'd like to say, to see documentation mm -hmm. that having a square rectangle around the face 
is going to be useful for any. Uh, I'd like to have the right uh, that having a square rectangle around roughly where face might be uh, is something that uh, that is usable in the real application. I, I can provide some help there because I know some use cases where it's being used today, which are encoders. Encoders actually uh, optimize with a with a rectangle, which is a face. Uh, if there are such meta metadata, and uh, the yeah. metadata in that case is only coming from uh, the camera, so it it all makes sense. Um, I really think that it's a good point that you define an API that is useful for uh, driver generated, as well as uh, algorithm like transform stream. Like you have a transform stream that is doing phase detection, and you get some metadata, and Hopefully, we should have the same metadata coming from the transform stream or to, or to the driver. That's uh, that's the point of this this effort. If we are not able to get that, or we are not comfortable having that, then uh, it, it becomes much harder to sell the the proposal. Yeah. So right, make a document out of it. That's a point. Okay. We can't, so we can't, we can't we just can. have, make this pull requests. I guess extensions. It's the wrong place. Okay, so an explainer, oh, right? Okay, yeah, a, a explainer and all those things. I have uh, sort of ready in my Google Doc, so I just know uh, need to know uh, the exact location where to put them. I can of uh, I can coordinate with Dom to find a home for that. I have the data sort of ready. Okay, so oh, coming. If I... But also, my concerns were with the API itself and whether this is the right shape for, uh, okay. and whether you intend to solve uh, sources mm -hmm. other than camera. Um, so sources other than camera, meaning um, like images? Right. Like, I mean, if I do a canvas capture and turn that into media stream track, for example, it's, uh, or is that, you know, or if I just have video frames, from an application mm -hmm. or something like that. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, so, we have I mean, yeah, just, just to maybe rephrase it differently. If there are cases where you can get the data directly from the hardware, it's great to expose it. But that, that API should also be usable in situations where the data is coming from elsewhere so that there is a unified API surface on which to, to operate. And, uh, and I, mean, right. I guess that's yeah. something that was mentioned uh, in December that uh, I'm hearing is still a concern with the current approach. Okay, uh, I'll try to document that. Oh. Uh, Okay. I'll I mean, even if even yeah. if browsers uh, today won't be able to emulate this in software, uh, they might be able to in the future. And so at least if the API is in the right shape, we don't have to redefine it. Yeah. So we're, we're we're able to emulate a fair bit of this in Watson today. So right, right. That's strictly strictly less performant than uh, than the browser implementation. Yeah, I can. Okay, I, I'll add uh, some data to that right in the explainer. Uh, I, I'll just move because I see there's not much time left. I'll uh, uh, the background blur, as you can see, was like one of the main concerns was we while we were thinking was whether we needed to combine blur and replacement together. Uh, as of now. Uh, we want to propose just the background blur uh, because the replacement, again, not many platform APIs are there. So uh, of course, there is also no platform API right now to control the blur level. But obviously, there are many frameworks where you can control. So I kept it there. Uh, but uh, it it will hopefully work in future. But uh, uh, yeah. This was a sort of simple API, like um, 
so platforms do some sort of in-stream in correction. And the example we present later on, you'll see that the users can either opt for this one, this API, or if, the, if their platform supports, or use the framework if they want to differentiate what a native look and feel like. Uh, like in short, suppose you're on Windows, the, and there is a Windows app. I don't know if you are using Teams, and you have the Teams uh, Chrome running on Chrome or Edge. Uh, on on Windows platform, it will look the same, the, because the underlying native call is same, obviously. Uh, any any comments on this this one? We have a ex okay. We have an example also, right? You um, just to mention that um, on uh, some platforms uh, like iOS, uh, yeah. Mac OS, there's the ability for the user to switch on and off background blur, for instance, and, and it's outside. It's fully outside of the control uh, of the web application, and it's fully dynamic. Yeah. Um, it does not, uh, so basically, a web application could not unblur uh, right. if the user decides to blur. But it, yes. but it could blur, the web application could blur if the uh, user is not wanting to blur uh, through uh, the OS settings. Um, <clears throat> that's not something that is well supported uh, currently by constraints. Uh, because mm -hmm. uh, constraints, usually you have a camera, and the mm -hmm. resolution, the highest resolution will not change. Uh, it, in, in real time. So maybe we, we need some API if we want to reduce constraints there. We might need some APIs so that, for instance, a, a web application knows that at some point background blur was changed. Uh, the user decided to, to use the system background blur and the web application will not be able to, uh, to set it back to false, for instance. And uh, some API is missing there. Um, so either even based or like maybe just an event saying, hey, constraints have changed or I don't know. But uh, we probably need to, to find something if we want to support uh, iOS platform, for instance. Okay. And um, I see other, yeah, anywhere? Yeah, it's me again. Uh, well, yeah. I think this is actually a case where constraints work really well. I mean, you, you, because it does allow the application to uh, state it's ideal, and then the user agent can still override it. Uh, and uh, as for whether an application should be allowed to specify exactly a background blur or not, we can always discuss, I think. But, but I, I generally support this idea that I think that uh, um, that the background blur seems to be a very popular feature that it'd be nice to have some exposing native support for. Uh, I don't think that ideal constraints uh, fully support everything there because you, you can it, it can be set after the track is created or after apply constraints or whatever. So we, we, we don't have good support there uh, to express all, all these things. And the web application might want to be notified that there's a change of background blur from false to true, even though the web application set background blur to false, for instance. So there, there are cases that we, we, we need some API there to, uh, to expose those uh, uh, that's perfect. Okay. Harold, any any comments you have on this? Okay. Um, uh, I'm I'm just thinking whether uh, people feel it's. I mean. Everybody is using this, right? So if we can provide a platform's API, uh, I guess is, I mean, I'm trying to find, is there any blockers apart from what UN suggested? Uh, well, just to be just to be sure about the, the background blur uh, level, it's a double right now. And I, yeah. I know that on, on iOS, it's not settable. So we, we would right. not, expose it so do, do you know that other it's, platforms it's not, that would uh, take benefit of it for instance it's not suitable anywhere but uh, on any platform api right now but if you use frameworks like all the ml frameworks you can adjust a bit of a 
background blur. So if if you write your own C++ program, put it into Wasm, and you can always do that. Uh, but uh, there's no it. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, uh, that platform teams are working on going making it exposed as uh, settable. It's uh, it's something that is difficult for for web application to uh, to set because they might not know the actual algorithm. So maybe they will do something and say, oh. And mm -hmm change it a little bit or provide a user selection and so on, but it seems like advanced, an advanced case. So maybe there's a two-step mm. proposal there. First, the, the simple thing, and then okay. uh, the double the double settable uh, property. OK, so right now, just the Boolean you suggest. OK. Yeah, I, I understand that as well. I mean, I, mean, I think the way to view this is that user agents may provide blurring, allow the user to blur their camera independent of this API. The question is whether the user agents feel any value in letting an application have a button to, to turn it on and off, I think. And uh, I could see an implementation go either way and say, no, this is the user blurred this. It's not changeable by the act application. We're not going to expose mm. that it happened at all, or we're going to expose it and not be able to change it. Or, uh, And I think applications should be able to read this and and if see if the property is there they could experiment with turning it on and off and maybe expose a button if that was useful but but yeah it does beg the question of how much blur when it uh, comes to, to situations with audio we have actually encountered uh, uh, cases where it was very val valuable to tell that uh, the user had been uh, been manipulating settings that were supposed to be helpful in the drivers, but uh, really messed the things up, such as uh, causing uh, double double echo detection and uh, and the AV, AVC controls that were fighting each other. Mm -hmm. So that was so in in that case, the most important property we had was. The most important control we had was the ability to to turn platform effects off, and uh, the most and the the, the second most uh, important feature was to be able to detect that uh, platform effects effects had been turned on, so that we could mm. ask the user to turn them off. Okay, uh, I understand. I hear that uh, we can remove the double as of now. Start off with on and off, and later on. Okay, you and I'll make the change. I have one okay. minute. Can we move to the next slide? Well, uh, I think actually, rather than trying to dump everything mm -hmm. into the last minute, I think mm -hmm. we maybe should talk about how to move forward in general. Because okay. there's you know a whole bunch of stuff here we didn't get to. So um, yeah, the the last three, Bernard, the last three were like just putting a bool, lighting correction, face framing, and eye gaze correction. All these yeah. are just bool. I just want to get a feeling because I did not get any comments from on the PR. Just wanted to know that. Uh, I mean, these are all uh, these are the features you will see working on FaceTime. Every everything is working there and. Uh, there are obviously platform it, it it works on lighting correction works on meat also these days right so yeah uh, oh, and what we are trying to do is giving give meat and teams and any, anybody the web apps uh, a way to use the platform features directly instead of running uh, the framework and obviously, they are free to choose both. It's just giving another option. And suppose Meet Teams feels the blur uh, is working fine on Windows. They can choose the, this one. And if they think no, they can keep on. I mean, just giving options to the implementers. 
So uh, yeah, we just want to uh, also figure out, uh, I, I guess, from the chair's input on how, what are the next steps here for the rest of this? Do we re provide time in uh, April? Uh, what do you think, Yanni, Bar, and Harold? Harold, did you want to say something? Well, how about you, Yanivar? I think you're still in the queue. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, I forget why I was on the queue, but um, I don't think uh, we have a strong interest to implement at the moment. So um, I know Mozilla's position on the Similarly named shape detection API is that we're worried about complexity variations and support within operating systems. Um, so we have it as a defer at the moment. So, but uh, I, I think the advice was given uh, so far was good from Harold. <laughs> so we don't have any urgency on this matter. Harold. Any thoughts? So for for uh, for the phase detection, we have a pretty solid uh, way forward, which is get this in, into a document and get the get the justifications and use cases written up, and then we can evaluate whether or not to adopt this. I feel like these other camera controls. Uh, would better fit as uh, small chapters in that document. Right, right, right. Okay. So put it all together in one document is what you're saying. Okay. Now. Is there a location you want location of the document or just a GitHub? Uh, my pick personal a, GitHub. Pick, pick a GitHub, any GitHub. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll work with you on this, we do again. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Sorry, Harold. Maybe maybe I misunderstood you. Were you saying that this, these go together, or they could be separate? I think I think it is better to have them together. I mean, right. they, these are if if we accept uh, the idea of uh, of con uh, of uh, using uh, the constraint API or any other API on media capture to control uh, camera driver settings. Then uh, uh -huh. uh, having one one big one document with all the camera driver settings things in it would be right. helpful. Um, I, I'm not opposed to that, but I, I could also see that media yeah. capture extensions has been used for uh, for uh, individual constraints in the past, like for uh, focal length and that kind of stuff. So there's uh, some to, precedent there to keep it separate. To to me, it seems really different. Uh, like one one is. In terms of complexity, we are talking about uh, a constraint which is Boolean or not, uh, compared to uh, a constraint plus exposing uh, complex data, uh, which potential interaction with other APIs. So it's not all the, the same thing. So, and I think that one could progress much faster than the others as well in terms of implementations for some platforms. Okay, uh, I got confused. Uh... Yes, you've got contradictory advice, so that's... Right, true. so we do, uh, I guess I will need to uh, okay. get uh, a, a clear input from the chair, so the, the, the sure. ball is in my court. Uh, I do think there right. is clarity that we want an explainer for face detection, yes. whether for the three or four additional camera driver setting, sure. this can just uh, be uh, small additions to media capture extensions or something else together, that, that I will have to come back to you. Sure. I have I have all the data ready in my Google Doc. So just let me know whenever you are ready, and I can do it. Okay. Well, I think we're already over time, so I think we're going to have to bring the meeting to a close. But thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, as mentioned, we'll be back in April. See you all in April. See you all. Okay. Bye. 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 Recording now ends.